okay. So folks can see that, right? Yeah. Yes. Right. Um, so thank you guys for joining. Um, I'm Christian Torres with Comité Civico in Imperial County. Um, and today we'll be talking about code responses. Uh, in our case, I'll be talking about our programs and some of the outcomes we've had uh, throughout 2020 and, and you know this half of 2021. Uh, and joining me for this conversation is Felipe. Hey, buddy. Yeah, yeah. Looking forward to uh, learning more about uh, your efforts and also uh, looking forward to sharing some of the efforts that we've done here in Pacoima. Thank you, Felipe. And yeah, well, uh, we don't have a lot of slides. We do want to have this uh, conversation if, for the folks that are joining us. So if you do have some questions, either from after the recording or during the call, let, let us know. Um, so uh, like I said, we operate in Imperial County. We also assist in uh, the Eastern Coachella Valley, which is just north of Imperial County. Uh, but we did have, um, I think five categories that I can categorize where our responses were, which was economic assistance for folks uh, due to the shutdown. Uh, PPE, at the height of the pandemic, uh, there was a lack of access to a lot of PPE. Yeah, I think we all saw that you couldn't buy uh, N95s or face masks initially. Uh, we also did emergency response. Uh, during the pandemic, we did have a, a huge fire in one of our communities uh, that wiped out a lot of homes, so we needed to respond to that on top of COVID. And to expand efforts uh, for the work we were doing, we also started a regranting program. So we reached out to foundations to be able to build this, re uh, this program to, for us to do small grants with uh, local CBOs, uh, which you know in turn helped us uh, work on our coalition building locally uh, and activating a lot of folks that you know were here or came back into Imperial County because of the pandemic and started either new organizations or kind of uh, became more active in their organizations that they already had. Uh, so for economic assistance, uh, we did start this program called Comunidades de Imperial, Immigrant Economic Relief Fund. Uh, the, the objective of this program was to fill that gap of undocumented immigrants that were not eligible for unemployment. They were not eligible for the stimulus and they're not eligible for a lot of state and federal aid um, so we started this program where we could at least give uh, a household a thousand dollars, and you know the household definition was left up to the organizations that that were working on this on on this big uh, immigrant relief fund, and we were able to define a household as who do you cook for in your house, right? So a lot of uh, even because there are uh, multifamily unit uh, housing here in Imperial, as there are in, in a lot of the low income communities. Uh, so we started this program. We, so far, we've been able to uh, give out almost $750,000 to Imperial, which is a border community, which is also why we see a high population of undocumented immigrants. Uh, we also had a, a smaller uh, pot of money that we were able to just kind of give out without restriction, which is our economic hardship assistance. Uh, so that went to help out folks that did qualify for aid, but it wasn't enough. Um, and they were in very dire situations and they just needed help right then and there. Um, as well as our, like as I mentioned before, our emergency response. So when this fire hit in the community of Nylon, a lot of people's homes were wiped out and this, and this happened in the middle of the night. So people couldn't uh, pull anything out and trying to escape. Uh, so in response to that, the next, uh, we were there the, in the morning of uh, with county, with emergency services, we were there uh, trying to coordinate and just provide people with basic necessities, as well as uh, looking for for uh, foundations that could just give a fund to just help out in the moment to, and to get people into, into housing, uh, being able to, to get them to where they needed to go to, to family or, or friends that could take them in uh, while they sorted out their situation, as well as uh, food vouchers, because again, this fire hit in the middle of the night and ravaged the community pretty fast. So they weren't able to, to save a lot of things. Um, not on the slide here, but something that we also did recently was work with our coalition members to kind of design a, a utility forgiveness plan uh, with our local utility company uh, because there was a gap of about $10 million that the utility uh, services were, were saying was here in, in Imperial and in Coachella. Um, and we developed a plan where people could get uh, forgiveness on at least 20% of their of their bill if they started paying down on uh, 
they started paying down their debts in a, in, within a year. So they just, and what that meant was they just needed to start paying off their new bills on time uh, for a year and then they would qualify for forgiveness, uh, which, you know, the utility company was, was, I was taking some money for, to do that. Uh, but the county also stepped up and provided a couple million dollars um, from uh, the federal CARES Act to fill that gap. So this, this, but this, we had to negotiate this with the utility company and kind of design the plan for them to, to take it forward uh, to help folks. Um, what we have here is our, our PP uh, procurement distribution. So we started out with a lofty goal of getting uh, 1 million masks as our initiative. Uh, and like I mentioned before, we're a border community. That's why our motto was Salud Sin Fronteras, so health without borders. So far, I think we've, we've reached the 1 million mask initiative. Uh, we keep receiving donations from all over the, uh, the US. We received a lot of uh, hand-knit masks uh, from a group called Anti-Sewing Squad. Uh, we received donations from FEMA, from the county, even from the farmers who we don't see eye to eye with because of uh, some of the things that they do here for, 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 with farm workers. We were able to do all that and, and kind of collect and then start to give out and do pop-up events take them to outreach events, food drives. We, we took all this PPE everywhere to, to make sure that everybody was able to get some, their hands on some, especially during 2020 when it was a little harder because people couldn't find anything in stores. And it was before all these new companies started popping up and, and making masks. And, and you know when people were making their own at home and, and sometimes they just needed a disposable one or, or a cloth one that they could trust. Uh, out of this campaign, we kind of we kind of got in touch with um, uh, local healthcare district and the public health department here, and we were able to start working on vaccination efforts. So we started doing first registration, uh, just getting folks uh, registered on the on the county health uh, system. Uh, when at the time it was Calivax, but people still couldn't navigate it pretty well, uh, and a lot of people that that didn't have internet needed to, you know, someone to help them facilitate that. So we were doing that for them. That turned our office into a call center, and that's how we were working on that. Uh, we also started advocating to get uh, vaccines for farm workers because they're one of the most vulnerable populations here. They were still being packed into buses, uh, all stuck at, at the border, waiting for, for the workday to start. Um, and, you know, their employers weren't looking out for them. They were putting them in conditions where they could, they were exposed. So we started advocating for them to be one in, in tier one for, for vaccination efforts. And we were lucky to be able to start doing that. Uh, I think the first mass vaccination clinic we held here after seniors was for farm workers and we helped register over 800 farm workers uh, to get the vaccine. And we kept that going. We created an equity metric within the county to try to get the people that are most vulnerable, which are farm workers, seniors, and some of the, uh, some of the folks that, that should have been qualifying already, but just couldn't get access to it and to this when they were doing uh, new clinics and we were able to do that. And you know, we started helping organize and uh, put on uh, mobile clinics as well as um, you know, big uh, mass vaccination clinics uh, with our local health providers. So we started with the uh, public health department, and now we have a partnership with the local health care district and another local uh, doctor who has various offices throughout the county. And there have been successful so far. We've been able to get uh, over 5,500 vaccinations done. And that means first, uh, first and second dose, or in some cases, just the one dose from, for the Johnson & Johnson. But we've been able to do that uh, uh, through this campaign as well as with our partners. Um, another thing we started was our, our regranting program that I mentioned, and we called it HEAL, um, Health Equity and Action for Latinos, um, with a focus on giving this money to other CBOs working in Imperial County that don't have access to big funder networks, so they don't have relationships with foundations, they don't have the capacity to, to work with state grants uh, when they're in the reimbursement phase, or even just fill out an application. Uh, so we were able to secure about $100,000 uh, to just regrant, and another foundation put it uh, did give us a bit of money to just be able to administer this fund because we do have costs we need to take in. Um, and for this first cycle, uh, and I'm calling it the first cycle because we're hopeful of being able to do this again in coming years, uh, we were able to award 12 grants in total. Uh, the projects ranged a lot because there are a lot. There's a lot of um, variety in the organizations that apply and, and the areas and, and the people that are running these organizations. So we have uh, a community gardening holistic wellness program that was designed by uh, college students that are in Imperial County right now that didn't go back to, to their main campus at Davis, at UCLA, and at Berkeley. And they put together a program uh, for a community fridge, a community garden, 
um, substance abuse uh, counseling uh, over Zoom or over the phone. Uh, and they've been working on that uh, for the past couple of months. And these are ideas that they took because they've seen them in the communities that they go to school for, but they have, they've never been here in Imperial. Uh, we also uh, funded uh, the staff time for a mobile shower for um, uh, unhoused individuals. So they, they take these mobile showers with a water, uh, a water tank to these, uh, to these camps and you know, provide the service to, to folks. Um, we were also able to fund other outreach uh, organizations that do food and, and PPE distribution to farm workers, uh, to families in need, and to uh, you know, minority communities here in Imperial. Uh, we are 85 plus percent um, Latino. Uh, but we still do have other minorities in Pearl County and some of these organizations, you know, are trying to build their capacity, but they're not there yet. So we were able to give that support to them to be able to start their projects without having to wait. Uh, part of that was also uh, creating uh, one of the organizations uh, that's out of a university here started a scholarship program. And we were also able to support a cancer support center to keep providing services for, uh, for folks that were coming in and that don't have access to, to insurance and that some of these uh, support services aren't, aren't paid for by their, their state insurance either. So they, we were able to do that as well. Um, again, one of the outcomes that we had through the, the pandemic and in our response efforts was coalition building. Um, so one of the, the new organizations that popped up is, uh, as you see on the right, is the IV Equity and Justice Coalition, which I'm also one of the, the founding members. And this came about, uh, with a, a friend that I have that, that works here as a, as a facilitator for another project. And she and I were talking about putting together a petition because our county wanted to reopen at the height of the pandemic in, in last summer, it was about June of 2020, um, when we had about a 20 plus percent rate uh, in, in folks here. And we were at capacity, our, uh, our hospitals couldn't take any more patients, they were all being uh, airlifted out or transported out into Riverside County, into LA, some as far as, as the Bay Area. So we were in a really bad situation and our county uh, officials wanted to just reopen. They wanted to like, no, we, we, need, we need businesses back open. Uh, we need people to, to start moving and, and, and that wasn't gonna work. So we started a petition and that kind of morphed into the coalition, uh, which is now bringing in members from other uh, CBOs that wanna do more uh, outside of their regular roles. We also started two community coalitions. Um, I have one of them here, which is the Imperial Valley Community Health Coalition. And that really started with the efforts of uh, the directors of, our, of a local wellness clinic and the director from my organization who brought all these folks together that want, again, wanted to do work outside of their regular space and were able to provide services because they, they worked in a certain field. Um, the other one I don't have here uh, is um, La Coalición del Bienestar de, las, de la Salud Comunitaria. Uh, it's a little bit of a mouthful, but uh, that organization is, uh, or that coalition actually did receive an initial grant uh, from the Latino Community Foundation, and they were able to, to start kind of like the first response system. Um, and then some of the members that are in, 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 in these two other coalitions, kind of we, we work together, as, we work with them as individuals, but they were doing this thing on the side and we were able to facilitate them getting that money as their fiscal sponsor. Um, again, we were able to create new partnerships. So uh, we started working more closely with the health department, which after a rocky start of, uh, you know, CBOs and individuals criticizing them, we were able to kind of like provide advice and guide them to what they needed to be doing in response. Uh, we created a relationship again with the healthcare providers to get the vaccines to where they need to, um, as well as kind of build new relationships with regional stakeholders. So we've been working now with more uh, with our county officials that are, uh, that are going out and, and bringing in resources. Uh, Again, talking with our, our assembly member to, who has been representing Imperial uh, for a while now, but he was a, the, our, you know, our advocate at the legislature and we were able to, to get a lot of priority for farm workers and other vulnerable populations. Um, and again, I just wanna leave you with some of the, you know, what the, our activities look like. Uh, we got some, some vests made. Uh, this, we were able to do a lot of bags uh, to get distribution. So it wasn't just PPE, but we were also adding other materials in there. And this is how we were also able to put the, the clinics together and, and work with the healthcare districts. You know, we were doing all these mobile pop-up clinics to get the vaccine to where they needed to be because we also don't have a great transport, uh, public transit system. So this is one way we were able to help out. Um, and now I'll hand it off to Felipe.
Awesome, thank you, uh, Hishin. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm gonna present super quick on some of the efforts that we've done here in the North San Valley, uh, and then I'll pass it over to, to you, Fatima, and also Irene, uh, and thank you for joining us. Uh, and then we'll have a quick discussion to see, you know, how is, how's it going to in your region uh, and some of the things that you've done in your region as well. Uh, so Pocoma Beautiful uh, here in, in Pocoma, North San Valley, uh, very similar efforts as Christian, and I'm sure as you, Irene, or Fatima, um, doing our PP distribution, doing work on utility depth, uh, food distribution. So for example, the picture right here that you see, we were able to team up with a local farm. Uh, and so the farm will be able to like donate food to families in need, uh, economic assistance. Uh, so we got some funding from our foundation and we were able to give um, grants for $500 to families uh, and fo we focus on the point of families, just the families who we know were left out of the stimulus check, um, in vaccine outreach, doing a lot of vaccine outreach on the ground, phone banking, having hosting pop-up clinics as well. Uh, the picture on top left is our last pop-up clinic. We're hoping to start um, doing them on a weekly basis here in Pacoma uh, because it is still we still have the issue you know, having access uh, to the vaccine. Can you go to the next slide, please, Christian? Uh, one of the things I'm focusing a lot is on utility, utility debt. Uh, we saw this increase a lot by a lot. Uh, community members just calling our office for help. So we've been we were doing this already. Uh, so we just had to scale up our, our efforts, um, just connecting low income residents to discount programs, uh, the CARES Act program as well, our local utility, which is LWP, uh, they got funding. So we were able to help uh, folks apply for grants for also $500. Uh, that will go towards your utility bills. And, and we we had to scale up our um, efforts because we only had like two staff to help out with, with this with program and we're getting like many calls a day. So we actually established a, a virtual customer service system. So now community members are able to interact uh, with us 24 hours, 24 seven. Um, so the picture on the left is an example of how that, that takes place. They'll send a text message or Facebook or the websites um, and they'll just say how, what kind of help they need, and it goes from there. Um, then the chatbot takes their, takes over, and then they fill out some questions, and then at the end of that, they get a list, kind of like on the left. On the left is the list that they'll get. They'll say these are the programs that are eligible based on your income. Uh, for example, a small check, um, of course, uh, utility debts, uh, discounts. We're helping folks enroll into discount programs for um, power and, and gas. Uh, we're also hoping we, we're replacing their, their cars, uh, but due to COVID, the, the program ran right out, so we just ran out of that on hold. Uh, but that's something that keep, is keeping us busy every day, uh, just connecting folks to, this pro, to these programs. And um, we, we actually, we're hosting clinics once a week where folks come in and we hope like at least 25 people uh, per session. Uh, so that's the way that we, we, we had to scale it up because we just didn't have the capacity to do one-on-one -on -one help. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and yeah, uh, right now we've uh, one of my priorities is our priorities is vaccine outreach. So uh, it's street based outreach. We're out there, uh, local stores, the parks, just talking to street vendors, community residents, anybody who's walking, and just asking if they have the vaccine, if they want to get, uh, if they want to get it. Uh, we're using a lot of tech communications tools like geofencing. That's been very helpful using Facebook. Uh, to and do pay advertisement for, for this uh, phone banking uh, peer to peer text messaging like through text has been helpful sending ma mailers uh, educational events uh, so we bring in doctors and, and from the community uh, and, and doctors look like community members so like African American doctors uh, Central American doctors that can talk to the community members about the vaccine uh, so that's been very helpful as well because. Uh, we've seen that once like community members talk to the doctor and they get the questions asked, they feel it's more like it's about getting a vaccine. So that's that's been helping us get our vaccine rates up. Um, and education, uh, and like I say, uh, we've been sending out information like recently, uh, in the last five months, we, we've sent out 204,000 text messages, we've knocked on 30,000 doors, 30,000 doors, and we've made 10,000 phone calls, and it's just Getting talking to community members about the vaccine and they have other they need help with other resources. We've been doing that as well. Recently, this week we've been promoting testing more because we're seeing an uptick in COVID uh, cases in our community. So we're going back to doing some testing. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, and yeah, some key lessons that, that we've learned through this is uh, uh, we need to meet communities where they are. Uh, so just, uh, that's why we're doing our phone, like calling, phone banking, going to the stores, going to the parks. We're gonna be doing that on Saturday, going to some local parks to, to talk to them uh, about the vaccine, um, address the community's health literacy needs, because we know because of systemic racism, uh, the, the, a lot of folks that we talk to don't have insurance and don't know how to navigate uh, the healthcare system. So we've been having to do that uh, for them. And of course, providing culturally and linguistic appropriate information to take action. Um, so for example, like this one of the doctors that, that we brought last time, uh, she's African-American, but she speaks Spanish really well. She was able to provide really good information about the, about the vaccine. And we have this event on Zoom, but we're still broadcasting on Facebook Live. Uh, and promoting trust as well has been uh, a big thing. A lot of people don't trust the vaccine. Uh, they say like, I saw this on Facebook, I saw this this video of this person like dying, or I saw a video that he gave microchip. So uh, having to debunk those myths has been challenging as well. And of course, uh, it's about making health equity a priority. So working with our partners as well to bring these pop clinics here, to bring information, to bring funding, uh, to make sure like communities have been hit the hardest by COVID are the ones that have been prioritized. And yeah, that's pretty much the things that we've done here 